Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Bruce Stevenson, and I have the privilege of chairing tonight's webinar. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. For those of you that are new to us, um, if you want to ask Samantha a question, we will hold all those questions over to the end, but please feel free to send them in to us. All you need to do is just hover your cursor over the screen. A little black control bar pops up at the bottom normally, and there's a Q&A box. You just click on that, type your question in, it'll come through to me, and we'll hold it over. And Samantha has very kindly agreed to field questions at the end. Um, so Samantha graduated from the Royal Veterinary College in 2002 and completed internships in private referral practice before starting a feline advisory bureau residency at Bristol University. She was awarded the RCVS Certificate in Small Animal Medicine in 2006 and the European Diploma in Veterinary Internal Medicine in 2009. In 2011, Samantha became an RCVS recognized specialist in feline medicine. She has previously worked for International Cat Care and is a tutor on the University of Sydney Feline Medicine course, as well as an examiner for the membership of Australia and New Zealand College of Veterinary Specialists in Feline Medicine. She's also involved in veterinary further education by the International Society for Feline Medicine, as well as lecturing nationally and internationally. She's an editorial board member of the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery and has authored two books and numerous book chapters, as well as publishing a number of papers on both canine and feline internal medicine. I'm sure you would agree with me that Samantha is more than qualified, and I know I'm looking forward to tonight's presentation. So, Samantha, welcome to the webinar, Vet, and it's over to you. Thank you very much. Hope everyone can hear me okay. And thank you very much for Feline Friends for asking me to speak to you um, this evening. Uh, cats in general, as you probably could gather from my bio, uh, are my special interest. Um, I spend a lot of time doing cat things and talking about cat things, and that's what makes me most happy. And diabetic cats are something that I think I'm seeing more and more of. And it's something that um, is a challenge for clients to manage, can be a very daunting prospect being the owner of a diabetic cat. So that's one aspect that I want to talk about this evening. But I do also want to talk about how we can prevent our cats developing diabetes. Um, and so we will talk a little bit about some of the risk factors and things that we can do as cat owners um, to try and prevent our cats developing this problem in the first place. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about what diabetes is, because um, it can be a little bit confusing. It's something you see on the news in terms of humans as well. We'll talk about what to look out for in your cat, how your vet will diagnose it, as well as talking about um, treatment, which obviously classically we talk about insulin, but there are other aspects of, of management of, of diabetic cats that we will talk about. And then I've got a couple of um, cases of mine just to, to sort of talk about and, and illustrate the points that we're going to cover. Okay, so let's get going. Um, what is diabetes? It's, it's, as I say, something that comes up on the news, uh, particularly recently there's been quite mention of the cost to the NHS of diabetes and um, in terms of humans, it's certainly increasing in, in prevalence and it is in cats as well. And so diabetes, when we talk about diabetes, what we're talking about is this particular organ of the abdomen, so the pancreas. And this is something you'll hear me talk about quite a lot over the next hour. And the pancreas is a, a vital organ in the middle of the abdomen um, of all species, cats, dogs um, and humans. It does a similar job, although there are some slight variations. It helps us digest our food. In fact, without a pancreas, you wouldn't be able to digest your food. Um, and there are a number of problems that can develop from that front, but we're not gonna talk about those this evening. What we're focusing on is um, uh, the main job of the pancreas, which is to produce insulin. So insulin is a hormone um, that we all have, unless you are a diabetic, um, circulating around, around our body. And it really is absolutely vital. It involves, um, it's involved crucially in a number of physiological processes, but mainly in the uptake, um, forgive me, I put update, <laughs> uptake of glucose into your cells. And you need glucose in your cells for many, many processes that go on. Um, if we don't have glucose, then it causes a great problem for our cells to do their regular daily functions. And also if our cells are unable to take up glucose, in, if we don't have enough insulin, then blood sugar 
becomes high. And this is a term that you'll hear me mention of hyperglycemia, so having a high blood sugar. And blood sugar is something we all talk about a little bit. Oh, I'm feeling a bit tired. I think I must have a low blood sugar. Um, or I, you know, I feel a bit overexcited with a very high blood sugar. But the fact is that in a normal person, in a normal cat, your blood glucose is actually quite tightly controlled. Um, so in myself with a functioning uh, hopefully pancreas although my uh, blood glucose will go up and down a little bit and obviously go up after I eat it should then return to a sort of average level and within that it's tightly controlled so even if I sort of mainline Haribo I'm only going to have a period of high blood sugar before my pancreas is going to kick in and produce buckets of insulin uh, to help me use that glucose and then lower that level if we don't have insulin and we can't use glucose, the body is forced to use other sources of energy and they are less efficient and they can in themselves cause illness. And we'll, we'll talk about that later in terms of complications of diabetes. Um, there are most, multiple effects of having chronically high blood sugar. Some of them are classically talked about in humans as far as um, consequences of diabetes, such as retinopathies and uh, nerve problems. And you talk, you know, sort of image of people who have amputations at the extreme end. It doesn't work quite like that in animals, but certainly there are big consequences to cats of having chronically high blood sugar. Even fatal consequences if diabetes is left untreated, a condition called diabetic ketoacidosis, which causes death in humans and in cats. Um, You'll hear the term type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And again, you're probably familiar with that from the human um, sort of context. And humans can be type 1 or type 2 diabetic. And I'll talk to you about dogs and cats and the difference between the two in a moment. Importantly, and a big message to take from this is that in cats, diabetes can be reversible. And cats can go from a diabetic state to a non-diabetic state. Not always, but it's certainly something that is possible. And in recent years, we've come to focus on that as to whether we can make our, our diabetic cats non-diabetic, not just control them with insulin. So just a, a sort of pictorial representation to anyone who's not really familiar with the, the action of insulin. Glucose circulates in our body as a result of digestion of, of our food and it needs to be taken up into the cell. It does that via a glucose receptor, but it can't do that without insulin. So insulin acts as a sort of key to allow the absorption of glucose into the cell. And without that insulin, we end up with a lot of glucose outside the cell and not very much glucose inside the cell for the cellular processes. So it's a phrase I say quite a lot in my job is cats are not small dogs, and it certainly applies to diabetes. There are great differences between the two species and between humans and cats and dogs as well. So in dogs, classically, they get a type 1 diabetes. So their pancreas simply fails to secrete insulin. There are various reasons for that that are quite similar to the situation in humans, where there's probably been some damage to the pancreas. So the pancreas has become in some way inflamed or injured or the immune system has attacked the cells that produce insulin and this produces a type 1 diabetes they don't have enough insulin now the other uh, form of diabetes that you will have heard about quite a lot particularly in the news is when you have a resistance to the action of insulin and this is called type 2 diabetes whoops type 2 diabetes and this is classically talked about in overweight people although it, it doesn't always uh, happen in overweight people it can happen in, in slim people and there's probably a genetic component to that and in type 2 diabetes Initially, you have enough insulin. I'll, I'll show you what I mean by initially, because eventually it runs out. But initially, you've got enough insulin. Your pancreas is, is doing its thing. It's doing what it should do. But that insulin can't work properly. So we call this insulin resistance. There's resistance to the action of insulin. So your body's making enough insulin, but it can't do its job. Because it doesn't do its job, you end up with a high blood glucose. So the outcome is the same, a, high, a chronically high blood glucose. But this difference is quite important between the two species. So the dogs I treat with diabetes, they go on to insulin and they will stay on insulin. The cats we treat, if we can deal with some of the factors causing resistance, may become non-diabetic, which is obviously great news. So are cats like small humans? Probably more so, certainly more so when it comes to diabetes than they are small dogs. And I've got a, an example here, and this lovely cat is a cat that I treated that was ironically called Porsche, um, Porsche, um, not particularly fast moving cat, I'll be honest. <laughs> she weighed about 10 kilos, so she's one of the fattest cats that I've treated, although I've got some pictures later of larger cats. And obesity in cats is something that classically causes insulin resistance. 
just as it does in humans. With this insulin resistance, we get this chronically high blood glucose. So we're circulating, running out to a very high level of glucose because our, our um, pancreas is trying its best to produce insulin, producing more and more insulin, but it's just not being used properly. So you're getting a higher and higher level of blood glucose. The pancreas, as I say, tries its best. And so it detects this high blood glucose and it secretes more insulin. So it's doing its absolute best to try and produce more and more to control this glucose into a normal range. But unfortunately, it's meeting more resistance. So you get this vicious cycle. And eventually, that will result in failure of the cells of the pancreas that produce insulin. So they give up the ghost, they get exhausted, and we actually call it that, we call it beta cell exhaustion. Initially, that's reversible. Eventually, it isn't. So eventually, they become permanently damaged, and there are some other processes that go on that contribute to that. Um, and the important point is that that then does lead to permanent diabetes. So they essentially becoming a type 1 diabetic in that they develop a deficiency of insulin and so we need to act on that and try and get rid of the factors causing insulin resistance so we have an opportunity to break this vicious cycle and reverse the diabetes that's not always possible uh, but it's something that we're we try and do and the earlier we diagnose diabetes the more likely we are to be able to do that so what are the things that are causing insulin resistance? We've mentioned obesity, and you'll hear me sort of go on. It's one of my <laughs> other pet subjects is obesity in cats. And here's a, another enormous cat. So it's a picture sent to me by a colleague in Australia. So you can see a very, very obese cat. Other diseases, such as dental disease. So this is a cat with, with very nasty teeth. I know that sounds silly. Think, how does dental disease cause insulin resistance? But anything that's causing chronic inflammation, um, it doesn't work on its own. So I'm not saying that all cats with dental disease are going to develop diabetes. But these other, what I call comorbidities, so other conditions that cats have, um, can contribute to it, basically. So it's often not just one factor. And I'll show you a case later of a cat with pancreatitis. And pancreatitis means inflammation of the pancreas, which is unfortunately quite common in both dogs and cats. In cats, it really seems to throw us on the diabetes front. So uh, the cats I see with chronic pancreatitis may also be diabetic. And I know for a fact, if I diagnose pancreatitis, they're going to be difficult to manage. So those are challenging cases, but we can sort them out mostly. The other thing that's a big deal in cats are drugs. So there are certain drugs and they are often being used for absolutely correct purposes and I prescribe them as well. But there are some that directly oppose the action of insulin and therefore they can cause diabetes if they're used chronically and probably in the wrong patient. The classic is steroids and prednisolone and anyone listening who's got their cat on prednisolone to please don't panic and stop it. Um, it's not every cat and prednisolone is life-saving in some cats uh, and very helpful in other cases. So I'm not suggesting we stop it, but what we're saying is that we need to monitor the blood glucose of those cats and make sure that particularly if they're an at-risk group for diabetes, so a middle-aged cat or an obese cat, that we're very careful with these drugs. And there are a few other drugs as well that are implicated. Acromegaly, I'm going to talk to you about later. It's another condition um, affecting the brain that causes um, diabetes, classically. Uh, genetics probably play a role in these chaps. So Burmese cats, anyone there who owns Burmese cats, it's been shown in the UK, America and Australia that Burmese cats are more likely to develop diabetes. And in fact, they're running a project at the Royal Vet College at the moment trying to identify what what is it in the genes that makes these beautiful cats, who I love very much, I love Burmese cats, makes them more likely to develop diabetes. Diet is a biggie and we'll talk about that um, a little bit later. Diet itself probably doesn't cause diabetes, but there are situations where inappropriate diets may contribute to insulin resistance, probably via this link here, the, the link between diet and obesity. So I shall bore you with that in a moment. Um, I mentioned some of these risk factors already. We've got another Burmese cat here that we can see. Male cats tend to, seem, tend to get diabetes more than female cats tends to be a disease of cats over about seven years of age um, if they're going to develop it it's unusual very unusual in my experience to see very young cats unless they are very obese and there's a nice study showing that if you're if you have an obese cat they are up to four times more likely to develop diabetes so that's a really big link as there is in humans and these are a couple of the drugs that i mentioned earlier so what signs should we be looking out for in our cats and these signs are also shown by by humans as well and it's something uh, something that um, is monitored in, in human patients particularly as we get older 
And the classic one that I hear from people is drinking excessively. So um, being very thirsty, um, urinating more. Now, this is something we don't always see in our cats because they, they often wee outside. If they do use the litter tray, what you may notice is just it's heavier. It seems to, to you be changing it more often and it, it's, it's really heavy with wee. Um, if they go outside, you just won't, you won't notice that. But what you may notice is them at the water bowl more often. And some of you as cat owners may say, well, I never see my cat drink. And I say, well, that's fine. That's probably normal for them. If you suddenly do see them drinking and the water bowl in the house is going down, that's a point to, to consult your vet. Um, it's usually accompanied by weight loss. Now, although I keep mentioning obesity as a cause of, of diabetes and association, obese cats that are developing diabetes will often lose some weight. They don't necessarily lose a significant amount of weight, but they may do if they're not treated. So the, the classic untreated diabetic cat will certainly lose some weight. What they may do is lose muscle and retain abdominal fat. So they sort of seem to kind of get skinnier along their back. You know, when you, when you stroke them, they feel bony, but they've actually looked like they've got a quite a fat belly and that would be a classic way that they seem to lose weight they're often quite hungry so unless they are unwell um, so unless they have developed one of these complications this diabetic ketoacidosis they would usually carry on eating and sometimes are very hungry um, and asking for food all the time and lots of these factors are quite useful because when we treat cats we can look for resolution of these changes I'm going to show you a video in a moment of a cat with diabetic neuropathy. So just as humans can develop nerve problems in their feet and hands as a result of being diabetic, so can cats. Um, so that's something that tends to develop later on, can be reversible, but not in all cases. So in some cases, that is a permanent change. They look a bit unwell. You know, they look a bit of a, what I call a starey sort of hair coat. You know, they don't look in their prime. And if it's not treated, as I mentioned, they may get unwell. And that's the point that they're going to develop vomiting, diarrhea and anorexia and be really quite, quite unwell. So this is a cat that I wanted to show you with a really severe example of diabetic neuropathy. And what's a little bit odd about cats is they tend to develop nerve problems in their back legs rather than their front legs. So although they may be generally weak, you'll see this cat does a little bit of a, I try not to laugh because it's a little bit funny, a um, bit of a ministry of funny walks. Um, but what you can see on here is that, let me just turn the volume down so you can still hear me. This lovely tabby cat is beautiful, a little bit fat. Yeah, looks a little bit funny, doesn't it? And we shouldn't, shouldn't laugh, but he, what he's done is drop, I call it classic dropped hocks. So you can see that his, his hocks are on the ground. He's struggling to hold his weight. So he's got to try and get up here, pulling his weight up, really struggling to move around. There is weakness in the forelimbs, but it seems to be just classically more obvious in the hind limbs. And interesting, if you look at the body condition of this cat, is he would be what I, what I would talk about. So he's quite fat in the belly, but his musculature is not very good. And his coat isn't brilliant. And he looks, yeah, if you felt him, he'd sort of be bony along his spine, despite being a little on the chubby side. And certainly the scales would tell us um, that he is a little bit fat. But he's very sweet, very sweet. Okay, so what's, we've got this collection of, of clinical signs. What are we going to test for? Um, what is your vet going to look for? And obviously it goes without saying that we're going to look for a high blood glucose. There's a reason why that's not quite so simple in cats, uh, I'll mention in a moment. But a diabetic cat's going to have a high blood glucose, no doubt. They also may have a high fructosamine, and your vet may talk about measuring fructosamine. Anybody listening who has a diabetic cat will probably have had this discussed with you. And what this is is a protein that hangs around in your blood, but it seems to, it, it sort of bonds with some glucose molecules. And when you measure it, it gives you an average blood glucose over the preceding about two weeks. So it's quite useful because it's going to be less affected by day-to-day -day changes, and it's going to give you a general average. And it's often used to monitor diabetes as well as to, you know, are we effectively controlling it? What's the average blood glucose? You may find ketones in the blood. So anyone who's, who has a diabetic cat would know that when we do find ketones in the blood, we, we're alarmed. And what ketones are is they are a product of sort of fat breakdown. So if you really can't use glucose because you haven't got enough insulin, your body starts to break down other things, so like fat, and produce ketones, which are life-saving. They are an energy source used by the brain, for example. But if they build up too much, they make you very unwell. So a diabetic cat with ketones in their blood is on the way to being quite an unwell cat. So that's something we would really try and avoid. They'll often have elevated liver parameters on the bloods and a few other bits and pieces changes that I would look for on a, on a blood test result. 
in their urine, they're going to have glucose. And again, they can get these ketones in their urine as well. And that, again, alarms me. If I'm finding ketones in the urine, it shows me that we haven't got diabetic control if in a treated cat. Um, and if it's a newly diagnosed cat, it tells me to get on with it and treat them. And you can imagine if you have sugar in your urine, it's going to be more prone to infection. So diabetic cats are another group of cats that are very prone to getting urinary tract infections. And that's something that any vet managing a cat with diabetes should be looking for the infection. And what did I say? I sort of mentioned that high blood glucose is not, you know, not the whole story. And what I mean by that is that when you have a cat going to the vets, I'm sure you will all agree as cat owners, they get very stressed. Now, there is a scheme, which I hope you've heard of, called the Cat Friendly Clinic Scheme that I've been very involved with over the last 10 years, where we are trying to make cat, uh, clinics much more cat friendly and therefore result in less stress to our feline patients. But there's no doubt that going to the vets um, is a cause of stress for many cats. And you can get a high blood glucose just by stress. This happens in dogs, but much less so. It's a cat thing. So we call it stress hyperglycemia. So you're totally normal cat, doesn't have diabetes, it goes to the vets, you measure blood glucose and it's elevated. And they will also sometimes have glucose in their urine. So you can make a big mistake here if you make a diagnosis of diabetes in a cat that is just stressed. This is a great illustration of why we should be running cat friendly clinics and we should be minimizing the stress to our patients. So how high does it go? It can go pretty high. Um, so in terms of levels, if I'm finding a blood glucose above 12 to 15, I'm starting to think, is this just stress? And a normal blood glucose really should be under five. I would say the majority of cats in the clinic, it's going to be between five and 10. But if it's starting to get up there, then I should be starting to think, could this cat be diabetic or even pre-diabetics are on their way to being diabetic? But we must confirm this because clearly starting a stressed cat on insulin would be um, could potentially be fatal. So it must be confirmed. And a really good way of confirming that is to check what their blood glucose is in a non-stress situation. So at home. And so sometimes we'll get people to measure their pet's blood glucose at home, which I'll talk to you about how we do in a moment, but also simply just checking urine. So if you have uh, an owner, a cat you're worried about, and you think it might be stress, then I would ask my clients to measure, um, it's to use a little dipstick to see if there is glucose in the urine at home. And if there is, then that raises again, alarm bells that I should be really looking for diabetes. And this fructosamine that I mentioned again, in general, one trip to the vets is not going to give you a, a very high average blood glucose. So the fructosamine is very helpful in that way. If you have a very elevated fructosamine, it means for the last couple of weeks, the cat's had a high blood sugar. And of course, as I tell all vets that I lecture to, we need to reduce the stress in the clinic. And there are things you can do at home as well. If you go onto the International Cat Care website um, or the catfriendlyclinic.org, www.catfriendlyclinic.org, it will tell you how to acclimatize your cat to the dreaded cat basket and how to reduce their stress uh, in going to the vets. And that's something we should all try and do. It's important when you make a diagnosis of diabetes to also look for these factors that are going to complicate things. So it, to me, and what I say to people is that a diagnosis of diabetes is a starting point, not an ending point in your investigation. If they have dental disease, it needs to be dealt with. If they have a urinary tract disease, it needs to be treated. And don't forget, this is a group of cats where unfortunately they are getting older and therefore they are going to get some of these diseases that are quite common in older cats. And dental disease is incredibly common. Um, hypothyroidism, so an overactive thyroid, kidney disease, and our old friend pancreatitis, which complicates everything. And these are groups of diseases that I see in the same age group of cats as we see diabetes. So we must do a sort of MOT and check we're not missing any other conditions. I mentioned before that the earlier you diagnose a cat with diabetes, the more likely we are to have a chance of putting them into remission. And the cats, obviously, if diagnosed earlier, are likely to be in a better clinical condition. And what I mean by that is a better body score, better body condition, less of this lean muscle tissue loss, um, less of the consequences of chronic diabetes, hopefully not walking like that cat that I showed you a moment ago. And so I think we should be looking for diabetes in our older cats, our middle-aged or older cats, certainly in our obese cats. Um, other risk factors, as we mentioned, are Burmese cats. So our middle-aged Burmese cats, I think, should have a urine dipstick test, very cheap, inexpensive test. And they should have that done a couple of times a year because we want to catch it early. 
And if we are treating cats with long-term prednisolone or high doses of prednisolone, then again, we really need to, to keep an eye on it. And simply collecting a urine sample at home. So I'm not sure any of you have done this. If you have one of these um, non-absorbable litters, there's a sand type litter here, but you can get other brands. And then the weed just is not absorbed and you can suck it up and then test it. But you can actually use the dipstick test just on very wet litter. So if you just put ordinary litter in, but don't use too much of it so that it's very damp, it will still be able to tell you. And actually, and I saw recently at a, a veterinary conference, um, several of the companies bringing out litters that change color if there's glucose in the urine. Um, so you, you just simply use their litter, which is same as ordinary cat litter, but it goes a sort of bright green if there's sugar in the, in the urine which I thought was quite a good idea. Uh, I'm not sure how much that costs. So a cheaper version, maybe some of these kits that we, your vet would be able to give you. Um, some people use pond gravel. So the gravel that you obviously the gravel that you put in fish tanks, and that can be quite useful because it doesn't absorb the, the water. So it doesn't absorb the wee. Um, so is there an area, you know, if you own a cat that fits into any of these um, categories, a, a really good clinic should be offering some form of, of review. And we have, you know, the cat friendly clinics will really focus on this. You can monitor your own cat's body condition score. And if you just go onto the internet and Google cat body condition score, you'll see various charts, sometimes one to five, sometimes one to nine. Um, they're often made by the food companies, but that doesn't matter. It's a universal scheme where you can see is, is my cat overweight? Um, and avoiding obesity and weight gain is, is crucial for avoiding diabetes particularly in this post neutering period. So we see these cats that gain weight year on year, just 100 grams here, 100 grams there from when they're neutered at four to six months. And these chubby younger cats with a bit of a belly, they're more likely to be obese adults. And those obese adults are more likely to be diabetic middle-aged cats. Um, so this is just an opportunity where we can be really aware of how we're feeding our cats and what we're looking for. And having a, you know, a good relationship with your veterinary clinic a lot of them now have healthcare schemes and in those schemes you may be able to to attend um, sort of nursing clinics to monitor your cat's body weight and all of this is good practice as well for getting them acclimatized to the to the clinic lots of um, you know gentle handling involved okay so let's move on to the the other important bit we're sort of halfway through our talk so i want to start talking a little bit about treatment and what we do once we've diagnosed it um, the aim, we have to think about the aims and what are we trying to do when we treat diabetes? And number one for me is always improving their clinical signs. So yes, I want to see uh, my you know, sheet of paper from the lab showing me that I'm controlling the diabetes beautifully. But what's more important to me is what my clients tell me and how the cat is. How is the cat? The cat's quality of life, the clinical signs that the cat's showing. And I think that's really, really vital. And that's always my aim in managing diabetes. I want to make sure that the cats are in good, what I call lean body condition. This means a healthy body condition score. Um, not excessively overweight, but equally not very thin. So some diabetic cats have the opposite problem where they're actually very, very thin. So that's an aim. We crucially want to avoid them having a low blood glucose. So you'll hear me mention hypoglycemia, a low blood glucose. And that's very important because that can be life-threatening in cats and certainly very serious. It can result in brain injury. You know, this is it really is an aim to avoid hypoglycemia. But also we have to consider what we're asking clients to do. We need to make a protocol that that is workable. If people are out at work for eight, 10, 12 hours a day, we've got to work around that. And this is there's no sort of bones about it that it's expensive to treat diabetes. It, it is one of the more expensive conditions month on month because it's a chronic disease. Insulin is not inexpensive and repeat blood tests are not inexpensive. And it certainly initially after diagnosis, there's a lot of ins and out to the veterinary clinic to try and stabilize them. And that's very important to work out from the outset uh, to how you're going to do that and to discuss the costs as well with you, the client, um, and not come up with, with very unexpected and very expensive um, costs further down the line. What I usually say is we want to maintain the blood glucose, blood glucose for the majority of the day between 5 and 15. Um, and if I can do that, I'm pretty happy. But what I'm going to focus on are these clinical signs and making sure that everybody in the family, um, owners and cats included, everything is working for everybody financially and also in a sort of schedule of life. Um, a secondary aim, and, and it has to be an aim and it's grown a little more, is to try and induce remission. And why do we want to do that? Well, if we can 
I remember my, my sort of arrow chart earlier on, if we can break that cycle and allow these beta cells in the pancreas that produce insulin, so the cells in the pancreas that are making insulin that are, are struggling and churning out tons and tons of insulin and exhausting themselves, basically if we can give them a rest, then sometimes they will recover. And this is a phenomenon called glucose toxicity. So basically having that very high blood sugar for a long time just totally exhausts those cells. And so if we can dampen all that down and control the glucose, then these beta cells might wake up and then start to produce insulin, which is obviously great because then we can take the cats off insulin, which would be brilliant. Um, another goal is to manage other diseases. And of course, as I've already gone bored you with, is managing obesity. So this is quite a happy cat at the vet. So I like this picture. This cat's quite rubby, quite happy in a cat friendly clinic. And some people will always ask me when I talk about diabetes, um, what about tablets? You know, they, they may know um, a friend, a relative or themselves that are treated with tablets for diabetes. Um, and this is used um, increasingly as a treatment in humans. So if you have type two diabetes, then your doctor before putting you on insulin may discuss using oral hypoglycemic drugs, they're called. So basically tablets that are gonna reduce your blood sugar. These have not been brilliant in cats is the, the honest answer. So in general, we say they're not indicated because they have a lot of side effects. So things, cats are funny. They have a very different metabolism to humans. And there are things that you and I take every day that are fatal for cats, paracetamol being a good example. And so some of the drugs that are used and even some of the, there's been some great developments in this in humans. So some of the, the very modern drugs that are used in humans um, may have some horrible side effects in, in cats. Like the classic one that's been studied is this drug here, which is called glipizide. Um, it still causes vomiting and diarrhea in my, in my experience. And it's possible that we are, we're not treating the disease properly. Uh, I'm, just throw a few long words in here but there's concern that basically using these drugs instead of using insulin we're not controlling the blood sugar enough and that beta cell damage can continue and and this condition where we have um sort of a scarring of the pancreas will, will continue there are occasional cases where people absolutely cannot treat their cats with insulin they may be financially impossible or I have met the old person who's so phobic of needles that it really is just going to be impossible for them to treat. And in that circumstances, sometimes we will try these treatments because as I say, there are some slightly more modern developments um, in human medicine that have been tried in animals. Um, there's none that are sort of tested and licensed for cats. Um, so we would be using human drugs. So that's the only, so and when I say, if the cat is not going to be, it's better it's treated with that than nothing. Um, but in general, it isn't effective. So it's something that it works in humans in, in some cases, but it doesn't seem to work as well in cats. So in general, we're gonna be talking about insulin, um, even if hopefully that is for a temporary period rather than for life. But in a lot of cases, it will still be lifelong. And there are some cats that go into remission and then come out of remission and become diabetic again as well. And when we talk about insulins, we talk about short, intermediate or long acting insulins. And um, the take home message really as, as um, cat owners would be that longer acting preparations are better. So if you're a human diabetic, um, generally a type one diabetic or a type two diabetic on insulin, then what you would do is every time you ate, you would take some insulin. So my husband is type one diabetic. And if he eats chocolate bar, he will take more insulin. If he eats vegetables, he won't take any insulin. And so he will adjust his insulin dose according to what he eats. And this means that he can control his blood sugar perfectly. And he's gonna have a blood sugar that should be within the normal range for the majority of the time. He'll also have a nighttime injection of a longer acting preparation. In fact, many of the preparations that are used in cats are used in humans in the evening. They use it as a once a day injection. Now we're just not quite <laughs> that good in cats. The metabolism is different. And so after cats eat, they don't have this big spike in blood glucose that humans get. So if we did that for cats, we'd run the risk of making them have low blood sugar. It just doesn't, it, that, that protocol is too tight. It doesn't work. Work. they can't tell us for a start if they feel a bit funny and they would like their blood sugar tested uh, and there are similar issues in, in children um, where interestingly they often will use continuing continuous blood glucose monitoring which is something we're starting to do in cats 
So in general, what you're looking at is a twice daily injection of a longer acting preparation. This uh, drug is an example of one that's licensed in the United Kingdom um, and in several other countries as well, which is called Prozinc. There are other licensed products um, and by licensed, I mean, they've gone through testing in cats. Um, the formulations that we tend to use are these, these uh, licensed formulations. And what's important to remember is that they have to be used with the right syringe. And this is something that every year causes some overdose in cats is that each product will have their own syringe, which I find, you know, think is terribly confusing. So if you're using Prozinc and you use a can insulin syringe, which is another brand of insulin, then you will have the wrong dose because they have a, a different um, amount of insulin per unit of volume. So it's very important if you are using insulin to use your what your vet has given you to use with that product which is often branded with that product so it's basically double checking that it is the right syringe and this is a, a picture anyone uh, i hope you're not watching if you're too squeamish of needles but um this is sort of a, an example of where we would inject cats so they tend to be injected around the, the scruff where you see um people give vaccinations but we do like to move it around a little bit. So sometimes we'll go down the cat's body. So we'll start doing injections here one day and then we'll do one lower down and one on the other side. This is again a little different from humans where they tend to inject um, intramuscularly. Sometimes what we're talking about is injecting just under the skin. Ow, excuse me, my kitten is just <laughs> jumping on my knee with his claws. Um, okay, so what if your cat has been diagnosed as diabetic? What tends to happen when we introduce insulin to, to cats or dogs is that they stay in the hospital. Now, this doesn't always happen, um, but in general, they may stay for at least a day or so. And the main reason for that is not to sort of not to check that we've got perfect control of their blood sugar, but really to make sure that we are not over treating them because of this risk with having a low blood sugar, because they just can't tell us that they feel like they've got a low blood sugar. This is a big ask. We're asking owners to learn how to give injections. And it's very easy for me because I've worked with I've worked with animals since I was very young. I worked in a vet clinic. You know, injections are, are second nature to me. But I have to be very aware that for owners, this is absolutely terrifying. And I, I had a dog I diagnosed last week and as a newly diagnosed diabetic and absolutely lovely owners. They love their dog. But they absolutely, she said her hand shook and shook when she gave the first injection. And so your clinic needs to be there to support you. And that's absolutely vital. It's not acceptable to send a client away with a, a bottle of insulin and syringes and, and get on with it, come back in a week. You know, we, you, if your clinic does that, go to a different clinic. You, you know, these, these cat owners need great support and dog owners. Um, so what we say is we, we'll start on insulin. It won't be a perfect dose, but it will be a dose just to get everybody used to this and to start treating the cat. And then after a week or so, we'll, we'll have another look and we'll see how we're doing and there are some mistakes that vets make in managing diabetic oh my kitten's playing with the, <laughs> the headphones now I shut him out as well um, just authentic I do have a cat in here uh, we take recheck after a week or so but don't change the dose too quickly or too frequently. And this is a real error that vets make. Um, they tend to panic a little bit and the blood sugar is still high. Oh, I must increase it. The next day is too high. I must increase it. And that, that's too quick. Their body can't get used to it. it. There's a settling period, I say. So, you know, the changes should happen. A min, you know, it's absolute kind of maximum um, minimum time between injection changes would be five to seven, seven days. So we get a slow escalation of the dose to try and work out what works for that cat. And what I say to clients is that could take six months, potentially a minimum of probably of three months for us to find the dose that works for you and your cat. And it's got to be this slow progress. Otherwise we run into real pickles and real problems and we can make cats really poorly. I think one of the things that's a, a challenge for people getting used to injecting, um, anything really i mean it, it tends to be insulin but we have the odd other thing that clients will inject at home and that's just getting used to the syringes and the needles and the bottles um, for some people an injection pen works better so in humans i would always use an injection pen where you have a sort of a dial that you you turn for the dose and then you take a lid off and it has a needle you change the needle the needle on it and you sort of press down on the on the plunger of a, of a chunky kind of pen and some of the insulin companies do make those for cats and that's a consideration especially if people are struggling uh, a little bit with with handling the syringes 
it's not perfect and I don't make it for every type of insulin um, and it's difficult to make subtle changes with those so if you want to make a small change a quarter of a, of a unit half a unit as we often do in cats it, it won't necessarily tolerate that insulin needs to live in the fridge and ideally not in the door because the door is so subject to much more sort of temperature fluctuations but equally not at the back where it's going to be frozen it needs to be somewhere with a quite a consistent temperature uh, also agitating the bottle was if you actually shake a bottle of insulin too hard you'll will reduce the effectiveness of that insulin so just gentle agitation and when people start injecting i always say have a, if if possible have two people there and double check the dose if i am injecting insulin in the clinic i always show somebody else um, this is a, a potentially very dangerous drug and so i will say is this three units so yeah three units carry on and that just makes me feel a bit better and so I say to people, just double check it with someone else. Um, you can get sort of magnifiers for the syringes because they're very small. And so if you can't see the, um, the numbers very clearly, and you can get these magnifiers. So there are tips and tricks out there um, that your vets should be helping you with. But those are a, 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 the general principle. And we often get people to practice on a soft toy or an orange, um, which sounds a bit sim silly, but it's just getting used to handling. And so we'll have a bottle of water um, and we'll, we'll sort of get clients to, to practice with that. And, and nurse, veterinary nurses are tremendously helpful here, much more patient and better than me at, at teaching people how to do it. And they should be able to demonstrate it in the clinic. So the client should do it in the clinic because do it where you've got help and support because when you go to do it at home it is really scary and your hands will shake like that that client of mine there are a few golden rules uh, when you're managing a cat with insulin for clients um, one of those is is making sure you are confident um, and you are you are happy to do it if you suddenly feel nervous you're not sure of the dose you're not quite familiar with the syringe it just feels a bit too scary then always check um, with your clinic never give insulin if a cat is unwell or seems unwell um, if they are completely off their food if they have vomiting and diarrhea or anything like that these are not the cats that need that are left you know see how they are next day at all these are cats that need to go to the vets to have their blood sugars checked and to look for any of these other diseases the other thing is that we say to clients is you must never ever adjust the dose without discussing it with your vet now People who own diabetic animals often become absolute experts at, in, at diabetes management. They become completely, oh, excuse me, completely brilliant at it, um, better than their vets. They know their pet very well. And it's very tempting in that situation to think, oh, they're running very high. You know, I can adjust the dose. But it's something that it can be misleading and there can be other factors. And so we always say just, dis, you know, do discuss it. If that's your feeling that you think they need a higher dose, just do discuss it. And always understand the signs of low blood sugar, which I'm going to tell you in a moment. But it's, it's really important. And I always say there's a concept that you, cats can get very unwell if they have a very high blood sugar for a long time. But they can really die if they get very low blood sugar. So understanding that we need to avoid low blood sugar rather than, if I'd rather they ran a bit high than a bit low is what I'm saying. Because that would be much more serious. There's a few kind of tips and tricks that we try and give people. Um, ideally, they're injected at the same times each day, but this is where we have to be realistic. If someone has a high pressure job with you know, working different hours, I would find it very, very difficult to give injections at the same time each day. I have children, I'm very busy, you know, it, it is hard. So I say ideally, but it doesn't matter if it's an hour different or something. I don't want it to be at 12 and eight and then at eight and four, you know, but if it's approximately the same. And we usually say, Give it when the cat's looking elsewhere and they really don't feel it if they do then we need to look at the injection technique because these are very narrow very sharp needles and so they shouldn't feel it they really shouldn't very occasionally you'll catch a little nerve and they'll do a flinch same happens to my husband when he's injecting insulin but otherwise they shouldn't feel it and every injection has to be a new syringe because every time the um, needle goes through a needle cap it will blunt them and then if that needle then goes through the skin that would be very blunt by the time you used it again uh, it also could introduce infection so always using a new um, a new syringe uh, which are, have built-in needles so that you don't have to fiddle about with the needles that the needles are built in there's a real technique and skill to getting rid of bubbles in syringes and anyone who's listening who who does this will, will know what I'm talking about it's very annoying we often get a bubble go into the syringe 
and it's, it is a real technique of how to get rid of that and that's something that should be demonstrated by um, the nurse or vet who's teaching that person and I put stay calm here because it is really stressful it's stressful to manage if I had a diabetic cat I would be super anxious about it even with my job I really would and the other thing to say is if you think it went wrong if you think maybe you injected through the skin, which is something that happens, you go in one end and out the other, um, or the skin is wet afterwards, you think, oh, I've just injected that sort of on the top of there. Don't give another injection. Some of it may have gone in and we wouldn't want to double dose because that's when we can run into real problems. In dogs, we tend to say, inject them when you're feeding them. And so we tend to say, feed them twice a day and inject them at that time. But as anyone with Labradors knows, they're pretty much guaranteed to eat at that time twice a day. So it's not a problem. In cats, if they are grazers, that's fine. You don't have to change them to meal feeding if they're grazers. Um, they tend to have a, a slower onset of their, um, obviously after you eat, your blood sugar gets higher. In cats, that tends to be a slower process. And that's why we use these longer acting insulins. So it's not, that's not a big deal in itself. Um, so I say generally offer them food while you're doing it just so it's associated with something more positive. Um, but if they are cats that to and fro to, to a bowl of food, then that's not a problem. So I said we need to look out for low blood sugar and we certainly do. They tend to look drunk. <laughs> so bottom line, they're wobbly, um, they're weak. They could be um, look vague and a bit vacant or just not doing what they normally do. As that gets worse, um, if they start to develop more severe um, signs of low blood sugar, then they may start to tremble. And worst case scenario, they can have a fit if they have very low blood sugar. But start at this point, hopefully, and, and identify these points and, and then have the, have the cat checked at the vets. As I mentioned, it is you know, really life-threatening. And so an emergency vet would have to be, um, be contacted. In some situations, you can try putting a little bit of um, something sugary on their gums, but this is not straightforward in cats. I mean, if you have a large dog, then there's obviously more gum to be able to do that too. And some vets will provide you with some um, glucose gels. And so humans tend to use these sort of glucose gels that are absorbed through the gums. Um, and certainly in very severe emergency situations, a first aid step would be to put a little bit of syrup or a little bit of um, you know, sugar or something like that on, on the gums. But what we don't want to do in a cat that's having a fit or collapsed is, is to try and put liquids in their mouth because they could choke on it. Uh, so the most I would ever recommend is putting a little bit of one of these glucose gels on the gums whilst you're on the way to the vets. Now, like I said in the last little bit here, I want to talk about diet. Um, and diet is something that's received quite a lot of attention in diabetic cats recently. Uh, as you know, cats are carnivores. They're true carnivores. You cannot have a vegetarian or a vegan cat. Um, it is not possible. They will die from various horrible diseases. And so cats need a high protein diet. And the majority of cat diets have it, enough protein in them. And it has been shown in a couple of studies that having a high protein and low carbohydrate diet along with insulin, so not on its own, but along with insulin may increase the chances of a cat going into remission, which is great. Other studies have not quite confirmed this and it's not something that's 100% agreed on because it probably more depends on the cat's body weight and body condition. So in theory, if you have an overweight cat and you feed them a high carbohydrate diet, but they still lose weight and become a healthy body weight, then they would still have a higher chance of going into remission. But the majority, the consensus of opinion is that they should have high carbohydrate and uh, sorry, <laughs> high protein, low carbohydrate diets. Sometimes you won't have a choice. So sometimes the cat will have a concurrent kidney disease or another condition that means that diet takes priority majority of diabetic cats are fed um, a commercial diet. So there are many commercial diets available that are designed for diabetes in cats. And so in general, those are recommended, or there are, there are some other diets that we can use. Protein is used as an energy source and there are, anyone who's interested in nutrition, consensus is around 12% carbohydrate for, per, as a metabolizable energy unit. Um, if you're someone who reads the packets of your, um, of your uh, pet food, then don't panic. The, the labeling of pet foods can be terribly misleading and it varies between um, 
sort of dry weight of the food and the amount of moisture. So you know, don't panic if, if you can't interpret that. In general, foods that are high in protein and low in carbohydrate will be marketed as diabetic diets. In dogs, we tend to increase the fiber, but not so in cats because that makes it less palatable. Basically, cats are less likely to eat a high fiber diet and high fiber tends to be higher in carbohydrate as well. If in doubt, a wet food is going to be better than dry food because wet foods, by their nature of being wet, tend to have higher protein and lower carbohydrate. So if I have no choice, then I'll change to, to a wet food over a dry food. And the really crucial bits are not just giving a random amount of food, but working out how much food is needed for the cat, whether they be in low body weight or high body weight, to maintain this, this sort of perfect body weight. Um, and lots of us, and I'm very guilty of this, don't weigh our food. And it's something you should talk to your veterinary nurse about. How much should we actually be feeding? In diabetic cats, particularly fat diabetic cats, that, that really is very important. Obesity, you know, I, I have stressed the, the importance of that. And in fact, even a small amount of weight loss can make a big difference. So we generally accept that even if you achieve 10% weight loss, which if you have a really big you know, heifer of a cat here, um, isn't going to be perfect body weight, it will still make a difference. And so I say to people, don't be disheartened, you know, even if you can get some fat off, you know, some weight off, then it's going to be a benefit. And some of these cats will go into remission of their diabetes. And of course, they have other benefits as well. Veterinary prescription diets make life easier because they are designed uh, to be higher protein and lower uh, carbohydrate. If people, they are expensive, which I do understand they're expensive diets. Kitten diets tend to be higher in protein um, and a wet kitten diet is going to be relatively high in protein and lower in carbohydrate. Um, I've mentioned with choosing wet diets. The advantage of using complete diets um, rather than any kind of put together diet or in a very overweight cat, if you just cut their normal maintenance diet, then you may meet deficiencies. In those cases, you're better off using obesity diets, which often are based on a high protein, low carbohydrate uh, idea. Some diabetic cats will actually have the opposite problem. So some diabetic cats that I see will be in very poor body condition and those cats actually need a higher energy density diet. And therefore, we, what we tend to do is not adjust the carbohydrate, but give them a higher fat diet. So a diet that's higher in protein, but also higher in fat, which will give you a higher energy density. And that seems to work quite well for those cases. Okay, and the last bit, we'll just talk about how uh, diabetic cats are monitored because I'm trying not to go too over my time here. Uh, you'll hear your vets mentioning blood glucose curves um, and that's quite simply a very simple graph that we make um, looking at time after injecting insulin and what the blood glucose does. And we make a decision about whether the blood glucose is doing what it should do. Now, I included this graph here because I thought it was really, really interesting. And this is from a study looking at the difference between blood glucose in the veterinary clinic and at home. Um, so what you can see is obviously going up this scale, we have higher blood glucose um, with time going along here. And you can see that in the clinic, the cat is running at pretty high blood glucose. So I might see that and make a decision that we need to increase the insulin. The same cat at home without stress has got a beautiful curve. And in fact, a bit low here, I would make a completely different decision about the the insulin dose based on that. Um, so that's something I'll talk about in a moment as to whether doing home blood glucose curves helps us manage these cats. In general, they still can be useful in clinic if we take into account this stress, but they may change from day to day. So we have to interpret it according to clinical science. So I will throw away the curve that someone sends me if they say the cat is, is totally fine and well. Um, and they're not drinking excessively. So it has to be interpreted with the, with the cat because of this issue with stress particularly. But you'll hear, you'll hear that discussed. What's very important is uh, what the client measures and what the client does at home. And so anyone who owns a diabetic cat, I say they need to keep a daily diary. And that's really useful for your vets and nurses to see how things are going. And in that we say record how they are in general, what's their, we, we use the term demeanor, that means are they happy, are they sad, are they energetic, um, whether they are playing, you know, feeling much better, uh, their food intake, how much they're eating. Water intake is very crucial and there we know that water intake is, is really proportional to blood glucose. So if you can't measure blood glucose, 
but you can monitor water, then that will show you whether the insulin is being effective. And some people will say to me, well, I've got dogs as well. I've got dogs and cats. How do I know? I said, well, just the whole house's daily water intake, assuming everyone else is consistent, will tell you what that diabetic cat is drinking. So we would assume that a dog fed the same each day would drink about the same. So it gives you just a vague idea that is still useful. And then we ask owners sometimes to monitor urine and blood glucose and always sort of write down when they're giving insulin. So this is just a, a small example here. And some people do some absolutely fantastic spreadsheets that are much, much more useful. Uh, but this tells us what we need to know. Cats had two units at eight, another one in the evening. We've got a water intake there. We've got a food intake. And so that's all, all very useful information. I mentioned urine testing and that you could just test soaked litter and so sometimes vets will, will ask owners to, to test urine. I won't make day-to-day -day changes in insulin based on this but it's giving us a guide. So quite simply if we see these ketones that I mentioned I know I haven't got brilliant control and I know that I probably you know, need to look into what's going on here and that I should be a little worried um, that uh, the cat may be becoming unwell. However, also if I don't find any glucose at home, I need to say, is this cat diabetic still? Are we over treating? Is there too much insulin here? If it's continuously high with glucose, then perhaps we're not giving the cat enough. I won't necessarily adjust the insulin based on that, but it makes prompts me to look into it. And so again, what an owner is doing at home is telling me a huge amount about what's going on with this cat's blood sugar. And then I have mentioned briefly monitoring um, blood glucose at home. And this is something that is growing, really, really growing in, in sort of acceptance. And 10 years ago, most we would have said, oh, it would take a, you know, an exceptional client to want to do this. But now we are seeing more and more cats where owners will measure their blood glucose at home. This is you know massively useful to us. It avoids this stress of going to the clinic. It tells us what's happening at home. And it is amazingly well tolerated. Now, there are some cats that this just won't, you know, you're probably some people listening think, oh my God, I could never do that on my cats. And that, that's fine. I've probably got one of my cats that I could, one of my cats that would run the other direction. It isn't painful. And it's just like what our human diabetics would do. It's also a lot cheaper. So going to your vets for a gl blood glucose curve could potentially cost several hundred pounds. Whereas having your own kit at home, and measuring the blood glucose and emailing your vet the results is clearly saved quite a lot of hassle and, and people can be trained to that and also anyone interested there is a youtube channel for international cat care which has brilliant guidance videos not just on this but on pilling your cat handling your cat just tons of really really useful videos and information if you're into cats then have a look at that for sure i've got a video just to show you um, how we do it uh, so i'll just show this for a moment um, so what we tend to do is warm up the ear with a little um, sort of warm swab. Uh, you're probably wondering why you put Vaseline on. We put a little bit of Vaseline on the ear and the reason for that is it stops the little drop of blood from spreading into the hair. So we put a little bit of Vaseline in and then you use often a needle or this is a, um, they, they use them for baby heel prick testing. Um, so it's a, it's a little lance basically, a little, makes a tiny little hole. Um, and then we get a bit of uh, a tiny little bit of blood there and we put it on our machine. So um, it's, it is a simple process, but you can see this is a particularly patient cat. This is a lovely Burmese cat called Sophie that we used in this video because she was so, so good. And her owner used to do this at home. Um, so there's some cats that will tolerate this and there are some cats that, that won't. It should always be a positive experience. So much as I'm saying we don't want to give them treats and we want them to be in a good body, body weight. This might be a situation to give them a little high protein treat uh, so that it's a very positive experience. And, and we wouldn't expect clients to do this all, you know, several times a day, every day. It would be something if they did it once a week in this initial stabilization period would be, you know, super useful to us. Just a quick note, it's a little bit of a busy slide, but just to go through with you briefly about remission, um, I mentioned this, this glucose toxicity thing and the, the cells of the kidneys, basically, uh, of the pancreas basically recovering. Um, and it can be a little bit of a challenge because if you have a diabetic cat uh, who suddenly goes into remission, then we 
we don't want to carry on giving them insulin, obviously, um, because we could make them quite unwell. Um, so we look for cats that don't have glucose in their urine. They're, all of these measures of blood glucose that we look at, so the fructosamine and the glucose, all goes back to normal, basically. And again, that home blood glucose monitoring really useful here, because if you just check the blood glucose in the morning before you give the insulin and it's normal, then that suggests you the cat does not need insulin and is going into remission. This cat is um, a Bengal cross cat um, called Tony, which is a brilliant name. And he came to see me with diabetes, but he was on a very odd diet, which I'm sure that the owner would, would concede. And, and he was fed a variety of different foods. Um, and I think that had contributed, not caused, but contributed to his, his high blood sugar. And he was a cat that when we sorted his diet out um, and we got him onto one of these sort of diabetic diets who you know, did very, very well and actually went into remission. They can recur, so diabetes can recur. So we have to keep them at a good body weight. We usually continue to feed that diet and monitor them very closely, again with urine testing at home, for example. And just a word on, on unstable diabetic, and that, forgive me the, the, the sort of slightly gruesome pictures, but it's just to say there are some conditions, they're very uncommon in cats, but will cause diabetes to be very difficult. Um, I've mentioned dental disease. Um, this is a horrible condition in cats called hyperadrenocorticism or Cushing's disease. Those cats are invariably diabetic. Um, and this is a cat um, with acromegaly. And um, we've mentioned pancreatitis complicating things as well. Um, just a, a mention of, of the potentially life-threatening complications of diabetes and why we do get so excited about it. And we have mentioned this diabetic ketoacidosis. And just say that can occur sometimes, unfortunately, randomly in cats that seem to be well controlled. Dogs don't seem to do this so much. It's a real cat thing, probably when they get a touch of another illness, for example. And low blood sugar, a real risk when cats are entering remission. If they're given double doses of insulin, which unfortunately does happen, you know, the, the partner comes home and doesn't think the cat's had the insulin and so gives it again. Or, God forbid, we read the, the syringe wrong. And that even happens in veterinary, <laughs> veterinary establishments. You know, an overdose of insulin is given. Um, if they're not eating, if something causes them not to eat is the other thing and they have the same dose of insulin, then that, that can cause a, a problem as well. A couple of cases before I uh, let you go on with your evening. Um, Sophie, you saw in the video of the home blood glucose testing, and she's an awesome cat. I treated her for a long time, a little on the chubby side, uh, as you'll agree. You know, cats that when they've been to the vets, we end up with, we do make them look a mess, don't we? Um, she was diagnosed with diabetes, seems to have no other health problems, according to the client. And she had a lovely, lovely owner, um, a very wealthy older lady who used to be bought by a driver, which I love. She used to be bought by a driver um, every time she came in. And she would come as often as you asked her. Uh, but she did have some issues with, with using syringes, which I you know, greatly sympathised with. She had very poorly controlled diabetes and she was being treated with a particular type of insulin, um, but only once a day. And that was done because the owner was struggling with the injections, but I think that really was contributing to her problems. Um, the dose had been very quickly increased. Remember what I told you is one of my, one of my bugbears, don't increase it too quickly. But she'd had the odd episode uh, of being unwell when you really questioned the client, although initially saying she was very happy and healthy, she would have the odd, odd period of being slightly unwell. And when we investigated her, we did find a lot of factors there's hypertension, there's high blood pressure, um, pancreatitis and dental disease. We found a lot of other bits going on. So you can see a few problems there. And I mentioned how pancreatitis challenged things. Um, and so when we have pancreatitis, we just aim for a reasonable blood glucose, avoiding very low and very high. So we changed it for twice a day. We managed her pancreatitis. We sorted her teeth and she did very, very well. So she was an example of a case with with other diseases that we couldn't perfectly control but we could do our best and certainly using a twice a day protocol um, at a lower dose was very helpful to her. And this is Pumpkin who was in a, um, a photo just now as well and he was presented to me again for, for very severe clinical signs of diabetes so he'd been diagnosed and he was drinking buckets of water still. He was quite happy um, and he had very high doses of insulin, which had been um, you know, appropriately increased. And despite that, the glucose was very, very high and he was starving. So he used to um, break into the neighbor's houses and, and steal their loaves of bread. Um, so he was that he was caught running out of someone's house with a loaf. Um, and at that point, I think the owner thought this is this is getting ridiculous. And he was an enormous dose of insulin. So anyone without a diabetic cat, we tend to use 
three units, five units, something like that. He was on 15 units twice a day and he still was so un uncontrolled. And in a cat like that, we've really got to look into it. He had various blood tests, which led me um, down the line of doing an MRI scan. And he had uh, a tumour. You know, he had a tumour in his pituitary gland that was secreting growth hormone. And this is a condition called acromegaly. And some very clever people, which is not me, I do the diagnosis, I let someone else do that. They actually, at the Royal Vet College and a couple of other centres, will, will go in and remove these masses. And then they are no longer diabetic. Um, so they have fantastic outcomes, these cats. Obviously, there are complications um, and there are other hormones that are loss when you remove these lumps um, but he did incredibly well he was off diet off insulin um, and we didn't see him after a couple of years and he was doing very you know very very well and this condition is probably a bit underdiagnosed as a conclusion. So the, the Royal Vet College did a study and lots of di more diabetic cats than you'd expect actually had this condition. So in summary, um, and I, I finish my talk now, you know, diabetes is unfortunately quite common. Uh, we tend to see it in middle aged to older cats and we look out for weight loss, drinking, urinating and, and usually with a good appetite still. We manage it with diet and insulin and remission is now, you know, is now possible. Monitoring is required um, and it's, it is best done at home if that's at all possible. And the prognosis is, is better if we diagnose them earlier. And we do need dedicated owners for these type of conditions. I'd like to thank you very much for feeling friends for asking me to speak and everyone for your patience listening to me. And I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Samantha. That was absolutely awesome. Your explanations are so clear that it, it really makes it easy to understand what is going on. A um, couple of questions uh, regarding mostly monitoring. Um, there's this new thing for human diabetics that's come out with these sort of skin yes. things and monitor on phones and that. Are they being validated for animals and can yes. work? Yes, it's really interesting, isn't it? Um, we have recently purchased one for the clinic. Um, so I personally have not used them yet, but I have many feline specialist colleagues that have done um, in both dogs and cats. Validated? Probably not. I guess technically needs more study. Um, it doesn't give you an exact blood glucose because it's measuring sort of the glucose under the skin, just under the skin, which, which does correlate with blood glucose, but not exactly. So what it's probably useful for is a trend. Um, so kind of a, a trend. So what it is, anyone who hasn't heard of this, it's a, it's a sort of um, little button with a, with a tiny needle in um, that you sort of put on this on the skin and very well tolerated you, you there's been some hiccups with using it in cats and, and people have worked out you need to use a bit of essentially super glue or skin glue around the edge sometimes people put a sort of t-shirt over the cat to keep it in place which as you can imagine isn't always that well tolerated um, they sort of put it tend to put it on the scruff or the side of the chest and you have to shave the hair so it's a little bit of a fiddle um, the answer is I think it will grow more in use. There are some issues with that tend to be patient interference. You know, you can imagine the cat removing it, um, but it syncs with your iPhone. So you can then have a look and you can then just send it to your vet what the, the average blood glucose is. And they tend to stay on for a few days and just give you that, that average information. So the answer is yes. In first opinion practices, they, they um, are not used frequently yet, but they're starting to come into referral practices. So I think when you have a clinic with a very motivated feline vet, you may see it start to be used. Yes. Um, so it's a very interesting development is what I would say. And I think it will be helpful. I think it, it, it certainly will take the stress out of um, glucose curves that um, as vets, you put a cat in hospital, those glucose curves mm. are a, a real shot. In the yes. Yes. Know? And yes. this is why home monitoring is, is so much better. Absolutely. Yeah. On, on the home monitoring, there's a question that's come in that says, uh, um, Gwenon says that in the past, I've been discouraged from using Vaseline when taking an ear prick blood glucose. Uh, the DVM explained that it would alter the numbers. I take it that this is not true. Uh, it's certainly not my use. I use Vaseline and I, I've not seen any. It's a, it's a paraffin product, so I, I can't see how it would change, it would change the blood glucose. Um, you, it, it, you put a thin layer on. I, so, I suppose if you, if you sort of scooped up a lot of Vaseline in the end of your glucometer stick, um, but we're talking about a very thin layer. And then actually when you, when you put your little stick on, you're putting it on the bleb of blood. So you're not really t contacting the Vaseline. So what I would say is I've been 
using Vaseline for years and I have no issue with it. So I can't see that as a problem. It's really helpful. Otherwise the blood sort of just spreads out into the hair and then you're sort of grubbling around trying to get a good, and you'll get misleading results if you don't fill the, you know, the, the end of the stick properly. Um, so no, I, I don't have an issue with that. And I think with the bio that I read out for you in the beginning, you are more than aptly qualified to make that comment. So I think we'll believe Samantha, folks. <laughs> oh, sorry, my dog barking. <laughs> the dogs are agreeing with me. <laughs> yes, 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 believe yes, mummy, believe mummy. I shut um, all of these animals out, would you believe? They've all broken back in. I apologize. Well, that's good. They want to be with you. Why not? <laughs> Um, I'm just filtering through here. We have got loads and loads of comments coming through and I think I really want to share them with you. Excellent webinar. Thank you so much. That was an outstanding lecture. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. You have made feline diabetes seem so much more easy now. Brilliant presentation and it goes on and on and on. So really loads and loads of applause coming through in a verbal sense for you. Oh, that's, well, that's very kind. As I said at the beginning, it's one of my my favorite kind of subjects, you know. And because, we can tell, yeah. we can yeah. tell. Yeah. One last question before we go. Um, Nicola asks, in your page on early diagnosis, you mentioned indoor cats being at a greater risk. Why is this? Yeah, this is um, nothing against indoor cats. Um, you know, we increasingly see cats that are kept indoors. And that really relates to inactivity and weight gain more than anything else. So we unfortunately know that cats that are kept indoors are more likely to be obese um, or overweight and inactive. And you can imagine, just like, they're just like people, you know, um, if we're indoors and, and inactive, then, you know, we are more likely to gain weight. And it's it's that obesity and weight gain probably that makes the difference. But I think the inactivity isn't uh, isn't brilliant for the metabolism either so unfortunately indoor cats do have their fair share of, of, of issues but one indoor cat is not the same as the other so I see plenty of indoor cats that are incredibly active and a very good body condition um, with an enriched environment you know who, who are having a great time so it, it's not a not a against indoor cats but I think when you have an indoor cat you just have to work harder really um, I'm probably quite lazy because my cats go outside so I know that they climb a tree or something and I haven't had to play with them really so I think I'm just more lazy if you've got an indoor cat you've just got to work a bit you know you've got to have your your scratching posts you've got to play you know I say play with them with the fishing toy you know get them active and monitor their body weight which you can do at home you know monitor their lean body condition really yeah, I think your, your key statement there was environmental enrichment and mm. um, one of the US University vet schools, uh, Ohio I think it is, has got the most incredible website on yes. um, environmental enrichment. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think too for me, I find with some of my clients, they get frustrated um, when they try and play with a cat because they think it's a small dog and they can play ball for 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, cats are predators. They meant to have massive bursts of energy for short periods of time and then fall over and eat whatever they've caught. So don't lose heart, folks. Keep playing short little games <laughs> often. Yeah, definitely. five minutes a day makes a difference to absolutely. an overweight cat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Samantha, we've come to the end of an absolutely amazing presentation and I cannot wait to have you back on the webinar, Vet. It really was fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, that's very good. Thank you for everyone for giving up their evening to listen to me. I appreciate it. And folks, thank you so much for attending. We do appreciate it. I hope you've learned as much as what the rest of us have. Uh, to my uh, um, controller in the background, Peter, thank you for making everything happen seamlessly and from myself it's good night until the next time